we should be live if this is working it would be super nice if someone could confirm from chat silence 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 yes yes all right yes okay <sighs> computers are terrible well, hi everyone. I had to reboot, so I have absolutely nothing set up. So let's start with that. By the way, how is video quality? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. How about instead text? If you at some point can see because font size or something, you just tell me in chat, right? Yeah, tacking dot dot dot. Okay, what are we starting with? We're starting, of course, set one, problem one. New file. We're going to do this in Go. Um, the idea would be to run it as probably a file for the functions that implement uh, the tags and one file for the tests that actually run them. So this would be set one. Hmm, actually, start by reading it. Okay, if you're not familiar with the crypto challenges, uh, used to be called the Matazano Crypto Challenges, and they are a set of essentially um, self-driven problems where you are made to implement some piece of crypto, usually broken in some way, and then to attack it yourself to extract the key, the message, uh, or anyway bro break the crypto system somehow. Uh, we are starting with set one, which uh, we should be able to do fairly quickly. Um, in they call the qualifying set, but yeah, I've been here before, so if there's something that, uh, that doesn't make sense, something that you want explained, ping me in chat, you can see it, but I, mm, I can see the chat in where you can see me. So, yeah. All right. Uh, As for today is a beautiful day in New York and we're inside, of course, so yeah. By the way, we're gonna set this on the not disturb. Alright. By the way, hi Slack. Yeah, okay, so why hex to base 64 is in the challenges? It's usually because it's meant to make you familiarize with how your language handles uh, bytes, uh, slices, byte strings, every language calls it differently, uh, versus uh, character strings, so Unicode, code point, or runes, or every language calls it differently. Um, so the Go is not, does not really get in our way because everything is a byte slice, also strings are nothing else than immutable byte slices that if you don't try to use the range keyword on them, don't try to use the range keyword on strings. It goes over rooms, doesn't matter. Uh, so this should be pretty straightforward. 
<laughs> I think I have the authors of the challenges reading me while I do this, which is absolutely not intimidating. <laughs> and yes, I think personally I do think it uh, belongs in here, the set, <laughs> the challenge one. All right. So hex to base 64. So we just make a function um, hex to base 64 which takes a hex string that way. And let's say that it returns a string. Sure, why not? Including, I guess, uh, an error in case it's not valid. <laughs> All right. Hmm. This is um, Dash, wonderful piece of software. No, I'm not paid to say it. Uh, that looks up with fuzzy matching the doc sets for um, Go or any other language. So we want some hex decoding, decode string, sounds like it. So, yep. We decode the hex string, hs, we get a value and an error if error different from nil. I am almost sure I have a snippet for it, but I just switched to Visual Studio Code, so I don't actually know how to use it. Uh, in that case, we return nothing and the error that happened, and if instead the value is valid. Yeah, by, by the way, there is no bots in the in the chat. If anyone wants to send me an email later, explain me what I'm supposed to do to have, for example, bang up time work. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, and then we need something to encode a string in base, from base64, so. I think it's a bit weird because it uses an encoding interface or something. But the encoding has encode to string. That sounds perfect. So base sixty four dot std encoding dot encode to string, we take our value and return that string. By the way, since I know... Okay, what's the problem? Yes, good point. Not returning an error. Since I do know there are a lot of easter eggs, it's probably interesting to see what the decoded value of this is. Um, so we print f as a string now as a byte slice, the row byte value of that. Now, new file, we call it set1test.go, which makes it automatically a file of tests that doesn't get uh, compiled normally. We, and we make a function which start with test test set one takes a t of type testing dot t and in that function we do what the this says so we convert this string from hex um, hex to base 64 And we assert that it should be identical to what it's supposed to be. If not, t dot fatal um, wrong string. Mm, yes, the error. Yes, this will be recorded. 
haven't decided yet whether on Vimeo or YouTube. Okay. This should kind of work. By the way, no, it doesn't bother me that uh, Go doesn't have a cert. It's much more explicit when I can tell it what is a error condition. There are frameworks I, for test, pretty testing. I hate using them. Pass. We sold it. And by the way, this is what was encoded in the string. So. Everyone the, uh, on board with the font size, editor, style, um, colors, go doesn't make, does make sense. If so, we can move on to crypto. Cool, okay. All right, let's get in the thick of it. For the record, I have no idea what I'm doing, streaming, etc., because I only ever give, give talks, not really streamed anything. So if there's anything I should be doing, do tell me. Okay, fixed XOR, a function that takes two equal length buffers and produces their XOR combination. Um, there is a fast XOR function that does horrible things with unsafe in the standard library, but we don't need to use that. Um, it also used not to check for bounds. So in Go 1.8, there was this nice bug where if you pass that too short a buffer for the output of some block ciphers, and I think also stream ciphers, it would just write beyond the end of the, um, of me the memory and sec fault you. It was nice. Um, <clears throat> but uh, since we don't need to do that, uh, let's just do something that um, I think it's called XOR bytes, something like that. Uh, whatever, let's just call it XOR. And we're going to use this a bunch. Um, so, what's a Go API for this? Um, nah, let's make it inefficient and make it return the, the result. Ah, yes, yes, Thomas, you do have a point. Let's export this. Also, nothing of this matter because we're probably going to stay inside the same package all the time. So, uh, A and B by its slices. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Thomas, you're fine. I was messing with you. Uh, since we don't want to return an error from this, if the length of A is different from the length of B, we'll just panic. And then we just make a result slice. This is the least uh, efficient API you could make for this because it will always uh, allocate on the heap something for the result, but eh, we'll optimize when we have to optimize. It will be in, in, in a few sets, not now. 
and for high range A. Uh, so the difference between panic and fatal is that panic is a built-in of the language that will um, just panic uh, and you can recover, uh, but it will it's a built-in, you can do it from anywhere. While it's like throwing an exception a bit. While fatal is a method of the testing object, which uh, makes the test fail and then stops the test. But for example, all the other tests will keep going. And you have no access to it unless you pass the T object down to our functions, but we're trying to keep it clean with these being the tests and these being the pure functions that you could use as if it were a library, say. Also, since we're not um, writing docs, let's just make everything uh, unexported. Uh, okay, so the, the first thing in a range statement is the index, not the actual value. So we do uh, res i equal a uh, i xor with a uh, b i and then we return really return rest if that's actually the xor symbol which i get wrong switching between languages this should work so we write a test for it Ah, uh, not sad. Problem one. <sighs> we should probably make a helper function that decodes hex and panics. if the hex is not valid since we are copy pasting hex that we know is valid so but something even nicer from a go point of view is to pass actually the testing t object and t dot fatal um, failed to the code hex. Mm. Ah, not fun. Yeah, problem versus challenge. Oops. Uh, undefined HS. Yes, it is undefined. Okay, so here we can do instead. Um, Ah, nope. We can take these two strings, so res xor um, hex the code t and this string, and the other string, which is hex the code t and this other string. And if res is different from me, um, yeah, to be fair, this should be an error because it doesn't, you don't need to stop the test, you just need to fail it. Um, Oh, you can hear the steps. Huh. I need to get one of those floating things for the um, for the microphone here. Because, yeah, wooden floor, recurse center. By the way, this is your moment, this is the moment for the recurse commercial. No, I mean, recurse center is awesome. Check it out, recurse.com here in the chat. Uh, 
Um. <laughs> Are there passwords? No. Uh, slice can all be compared to nil. Yes, these are two slices, so we need to use bytes dot equal. If not bytes dot equal, ah, <laughs> I got trolled by the chat box. Where is the ban button? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pass, solved problem two. Okay, well, we're just building a tool set here. Again, if at any point you want it to go slower, faster, well, no, not faster, uh, slower, or want to, me to explain go more or anything, yes, tell me. So the hex encoded string uh, has been XORed against a single character. Find the key, decrypt the message. Right code to do it for you. How the best method for scoring a piece of English plain text? Chart of frequency is a good metric. Evaluate each output and choose the one with the best score. Okay. So we could do this pretty easily, but if we build something well done, we will use it um, later on. So what this does, uh, this is breaking a Caesar um, cipher. Everything has been XORed against the same character, so you can just brute force which character it is, but uh, a human would be able to tell immediately what is what makes sense, like what is um, uh, what is the right one. How does a computer know when it stumbled upon English, um, like when it got it right? Scoring. Um, a usual way to do it is by using character frequency, so in English, certain letters are going to be more frequent than others. Uh, what's the name of that thing with all the books? Project Gutenberg. We're going to take a bunch of Project Gutenberg books, and which are open source books. Um, can we get them by... How recent they are because we don't want archaic English I guess and we can build a score for each letter and then just add together the score of it it's probably a shitty metric but eh. uh, we can tweak it later if we need something more mathy um, latest sounds like it no, it doesn't. The Colonial Reformer. No. Top 100. Top 100 it is. Pride and Prejudice. I mean, sure. Sherlock Holmes. I guess why not. Um. <laughs> Good. Pride and Prejudice is approved. But I have something for Alice in Wonderland. I used to act... Um, theater play. Uh, I was the um, Crazy Bunny, which I have no idea how it's called in English. Um, the Friend of the Mad Hatter. Uh, yeah. I have some wonder like this. <coughs> Plain text. This. Yeah, um, there are lots of invented words, but we're not going to use words. Um, at least for now, we're just going to use the frequency of letters. So unless something changed strongly, it should be all right. Um, as for pen to action, it uses uh, both direction. We're going to just cut out everything that is not um, ASCII, I would, I would say. Ooh, someone recognized mortality. Don't Google that. If I've seen people not be happy with what mortality is. Um, all right. 
um, we will download that into CryptoPulse. <laughs> and then we build something that will read build a corpus uh, which should probably be a map from rune to ha fan remember when i told you never to iterate over a string we're about to iterate over a string because uh, when you iterate over a string, it goes over the Unicode runes uh, by decoding UTF-8 in the string. So that's kind of what we want here. So we're going to do that. Um, so we uh, build corpus uh, text string and it will return a map from rune to a float 64 score. We try to normalize for the length of the text, of course. So we're gonna use floats as in relative uh, frequencies of each. Um, yeah, pretending we already have the corpus, uh, we uh, corpus C is a new map from rune to float 64. Should we normalize at the end or at the start? We should normalize at the end. Um, oh, thanks. This was not meant to be in... Thank you. Uh, 100 QREF. Um, about the internet connection, I'm almost sure that Recurse has gigabit. Uh, but I'm over Wi-Fi, so... Mm. Uh, so, for underscore rune... Huh. How do we get the length in rooms? Well, to decode the whole text from UTF-8, it will have to go through each. So, I'm gonna just... Let's do it later, let's keep it simple. Um, uh, I don't want to do fancy. Mm. This is the function. Rune count in string. Okay, we have um, a way to, a way to do it. Cool. <sighs> So the cool thing about um, Go Maps is that it they have a default zero value. So if I load this, it will be zero if the character hasn't been um, loaded yet. And finally, we... Total is UTF eight dot room count in string text, which is inefficient because now we're iterating twice, but again, we don't care. Um, this iterates over the keys instead because we're iterating over a map. Um, this 
will probably just fail, yes, because there's a float 64 and an int. So we convert this to float 64. It's probably overkill to use float 64s instead of float 32s, but I never really developed an intuition for it, so we use whatever we have. And we return C. So that should be normalized by length. Um, this should kind of work. Uh, yeah, this should work. And let's make a helper for corpus from file. Uh, should be in, in the tests. Mostly yes, because I want to uh, pass. Uh, yeah, I can just directly implement the directly increment the map. I didn't want it to be too um, weird, but yeah, sure, why not? I want to have access to testing T so that we don't have to return an error. Um, should I define a type for the corpus? Probably, but I can't be bothered right now. Do we? We don't get the dogs. Well, they were kind of obvious. Uh, the documentation interface is dash, yes, thanks. Um, the color highlighting, yeah, it's intentional. Um, I'm trying it out. If it disturbs you too much, let me know. Uh, um. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay. Um, pop, 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 pop. And we get a corpus from file. We can rely on this because the um, go tests always CD into your um, your folder. Actually, to do it right, we will put it into a test data. And just to make sure we're doing it right. We're gonna iterate over it and see if the numbers kinda make sense. Um, T dot log F. I seriously don't know why I'm not getting autocompletion. 
Hopefully this prints the rune and not the number. Not positive though. Um, let's see. Dash, it's percent C. Uh, and floating point, I want to limit the precision. There we go. Dash is worth every single penny. Trust me. Okay, so, uh, right, some unprintables. Uh, e is pretty high, 7 is pretty low, D is pretty high, but not as high as E. This looks right. Where is A? Um, A is high. Yeah. This should work. Yeah, lowercase and uppercase, I, I don't think I should alias them uh, because you'll get a bunch of uppercases more if you got the wrong key because they will get selected essentially at random. So, yeah. So, no, I think that it makes sense to, to keep them separate. Okay, so... Um, um, let's build a function that scores a text. Super simple. Essentially the same thing. <coughs> mm. This is the same function. This should do. And finally, a uh, um, single XOR function. Again, the most inefficient API ever. But make sure that we don't 
fuck it up by keeping modifying the same thing uh, instead of modifying always the original, which I did and might have costed me a couple hours in set 7. So, yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. We could use a pen, but why make it even more slow? Um. Uh, if the character is not in the C map, it will just return zero because there's a um, default zero value with uh, Go maps. It's wonderful. It lets you do nice things if you make your zero values useful, um, which is one of the things that make idiomatic co uh, Go code idiomatic. Uh, okay, uh, this should kind of do. Uh, all right, let's even make a final function for... I'm making a lot of small functions, but reusable. Um, Since there are constants, I can just do this. And this is a typical look for the maximum thing where we keep the last score and if what we are what we have at this time is higher um, mm. we convert to string here because we can assume that it might be UTF-8. I know that it, it isn't. Actually, no, no, no. One of the sets had UTF-8 and that sent me crazy. So yes, let's keep doing this. Sorry for the spoiler. Um, uh, we score the result with our corpus with, that we forgot to pass to the function. And if the score is higher than the last score, we set the last score to the current score, and we set the result to what we are currently holding. And finally, we return our result. And nothing works. Um, overflows by it. Yeah, no, I can't do that. Um, hmm? It's a nice way to do it, I guess. If anyone has a better way to do this, that would be cool. Yes, this rest. Okay. This should work.
<laughs> and there's no real way to check if it passed except printing it. So we just t dot log. Um, Okay, if we did this right, this should just work. Uh, everybody following what we're doing, we are building a corpus of what letters are most indicative of, yes, this is English from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and then we're passing it to a function that will score for each possible single XOR key, where each byte in the slice is XORed with the same byte, a Caesar cipher. Uh, we take the, the score, if the score is better than the previous one, we keep that result and then we return that, that result. Um, and yeah, we score simply by giving it. What do you imagine? Um, oh... It's taking a long time. Why is this taking such a long time? This is not working. <laughs> this did not work. What the hell is it doing? What? What can it be doing? Okay, um, control backslash kills something, a Go program giving a stack trace. So, it's stuck in score English on line 45. Huh. Seriously, that slow? This is surprising. Um, is iterating over... There must be some infinite loop here. But this will eventually exit. Print line uh, debugging. Oh, shut up. Yeah, haha, <laughs> no. <laughs> I knew there was something wrong about this. Oh! It never, it's, it never breaks this condition because it goes to 255 and then to zero and it's still lower than 255. Cute. How the hell do I do this right? Um, no, no, byte is already unsigned. Um, Huh, um, <laughs> currently attacking myself, yes, also I forgot to update that. It kinda is, you feel like, at least go vet should warn about it, and it doesn't. Um, how do you explore all the values. This is stupid. Oh, this is gonna be horrible. But I think this is it. It all doesn't get evaluated at the beginning, does it? Maybe it does. We'll see. Um, what happened? 
yeah, no, it never got evaluated. <sighs> um, this is the stupidest thing to be stuck on. Overrun is guaranteed by the, the language, but this is the stupidest thing to be stuck on. Um, okay, I'm... Yeah, I'm just gonna... This is silly. This is... Wow. Okay. All right. Um, drum roll. Remove this line. Oh. Yes. Works. Okay. First secret message with the code. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland is a good text. I'm happy. I'm seriously... Is there really no way to express it by using... To express explore all values of an int value by using types of that value? That can't be right. Um, huh. Challenge work. Uh, okay, one of them, so you need to detect it. Um, hmm, uh, it says that one of the strings in here is um, uh, has been encrypted by a single character XOR. Okay, um, to know if we stumbled up on the right one, we will need to modify our find to also return the score. Thankfully, we have it easy to get over here. So we change this. We ignore the value in test problem three. And in test problem four, We take, um, we still build a corpus, just like, I don't know, you know what? The corpus is always gonna be the same. So let's make a simple func in it. Oh, actually even, um, This will just get evaluated at the beginning. Hold on a second. This is not getting auto... Ah, that's why. Okay, for a second I thought I didn't have GoFMT. So we don't need the corpus. And instead we open the file, which is the exact same here. <coughs> mm -hmm. The name is 4.txt. <laughs> and mm. uh, it's 
this dot split, I think. Yes. S and then sep. So first the text and then uh, might as well. We split by lines and for each line we are obscuring the val variable, which is fine actually, let's just um, hex the code, actually no we can't because it's a different type, so let's pass something like this. Um, Mm, I always forget the range keyword. What's wrong with this? Oh. Uh, mm. There is a way to do something when tests start, which is a testing dot. Um, it's explained somewhere here. Uh, test main. Here we go. What is a testing dot m though? Does it have? No, so it doesn't help us at all. Actually, that was a bad idea. Uh, whatever. Let's just make it panic. that break the capitalization rules. Sad. Okay, this should work. Back to us. Um, line is now our line, so we do the exact same thing we did here. Press and score. Uh, we do the same with last score. The exact same thing we did in the other file. It's unlikely we would reuse this, so let's just slap it into the test uh, function. work. They should pick the one with the highest score and display it to us. Oh, now that the part is jumping. Perfect. Okay. Right back. Uh, no. Number four is done. Number five. Everybody followed up to here. Yes, no. Too fast, too slow. Not commenting enough on Go, not commenting enough on crypto. Should I have explained what XOR is? Are you happy Googling at the same time? Essentially, I have no idea what I'm doing, so do some feedback.
Also, if you're trying to tweet or anything, I only look at the um, Twitch chat. Okay, so implement repeating key XOR. We're getting secure here. Here's the opening stanza of an important work of, in, of the English language. <laughs> um, encrypted under the key ICE um, using repeating key XOR. Repeating key XOR. Um, yeah, essentially, repeating key XOR, uh, instead of using always the same um, byte to XOR each byte, it goes over the bytes of a key over time. Uh, what is it in ancient? Um, a visionaire cipher was that? Was it that? Anyway, so this would be encoded with I, this with this with C, this with E, and then again I, C, E, I, and you know, keep going like that. Um, We are not gonna do that, um, uh, but yes, let's implement uh, repeating key XOR. I'm happy about the decision of not exporting things because if I publish this on GitHub and export it, someone will use it and say that Filippo said it, wrote it, so it's fine. So, no. Repeating XOR. Um, in and key now are both byte strings. And let's use the same dumb API we used. <sighs> uh, again, we make a slice for the result, and then for each thing in the key, we will do something and then return the result. Now, we can be clever here and just use modulo. So, in, I kind of don't like using C here, it hides things. So we XOR with the byte in the key that is at the position of I modulo the length of the key. So the it, for position zero it will be zero in the key, one, one in the key, two, two in the key, three, three modulo three is zero, so it will go back to zero in the key. So that should be it to implement repeating XOR. Also, a len is not, does not actually take time because the um, byte slices are nothing else than a struct of which one of the values is a length. So there's no point in saving len since we're using it in a you know tight loop because we need high performance repeating XOR. Okay. Um, I kind of assume this was meant to have this slash n in it. Not even positive. Um, what's slash n? Um, new line is. Uh, 0a. Is there a 0a in this page? Yes. So this is meant to have the new line character in it. So, we use the backticks because they maintain everything as is, including the session, but we have to the an indent, otherwise the indentation will end up in there. And we apply a repeating 
XOR. input with key ice <coughs> I'm trying to be consistent in using byte slices for everything except um, well English text and uh, hex I copy paste hmm, kind of if res is different from hex the code t yes right these are byte slices error wrong result res it would do a good job pass okay we have repeating XOR implemented everybody on board on how we did it Implement x, break x. Oh, I missed this. Problem 6 is one uh, that a lot of people got stuck on, so I'll maybe try to slow down a bit, but yeah. I did install Go code. Um, I have no idea why it's not working. Uh, kinda don't want to figure it out now, but I. This is supposed to work. Mm. Okay, it's on. Uh, okay, there's a file. It's base64 after being encrypted with repeating key XOR. Okay, copy link press, download. We need to decrypt it. So this is how, yeah, visionary it's um, it's broken. Um, you start by assuming a key size. So yeah, you pick a key size. You don't know which one it is, but you run the function for each, and sooner or later you'll fill, you'll get a high score. You write a function to uh, get the Hamming distance. Yes, okay. Let's start by writing that. Um, ha the Hamming distance is a function that lets you essentially estimate how different two strings are. Do we want it at the bit level or at the byte level? Like, do we want bit level Hamming distance? Here it says different bits. Um, yeah, also because these have no bytes in common and. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, we're using this to estimate which key size is the right one. Now remember, yes. Um, right. <clears throat> yep, 
Yeah, because um, the Hamming distance does not change. If you have the right key size, the Hamming distance is the same as the Hamming distance between the plain texts, because both have been XOR with the same values. Okay, so we're on the bit level. We'll go back as to why that happens later. Um, Mm. Yeah, kind of didn't want to. Ooh, I get to use. Hold on. Yes! <laughs> okay, I kind of always wanted to use the math.bits package in Go. Um, and I think we get to use it here. Um, yep. Because, yeah, what this suggests is that a way to calculate the Hamming distance. is to. Uh, compute the XOR because if the if they are equal um, XOR will be zero so this will be one one uh, zero 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 um, one zero one 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 zero zero so if you apply XOR you get as many one bits set in the in the value as there are um, different bits, which is the definition of Hamming distance, if you think about it. Uh, so if what we, uh, what we do is just XOR the two byte values and then run bits.onceCount8, we get the Hamming distance by summing them up. Yes, I get to avoid bit. Um, yes, it's cheating. I don't care. <laughs> uh. mm -mm. If there are this we panic because we don't want to return an error Byte we take the we add the result bits dot once count eight <coughs> for a i xord with b i and then we return the rest everybody on board on why this works once count a uses one of the nifty low level um, cpu instructions to count the number of one bits so it's going to be super fast our hamming distance function hmm. could we make could make it faster by taking you in 32s or you in 64s at a time. Anyway, uh, and when you XOR, the one bits are the ones that were different between the two inputs. Damn, you're all judging all the software I use. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, 
Okay, so problem six. T testing T. Okay. Let's see. Uh, if our Hamming distance function it works. Okay. So now that we have a function that can tell us how many different bits are, for example, here the result would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The now that we have that, we can use it to figure out the key size. So we don't know how long the repeating key um, XOR key is here. So if we imagine to stack the, um, the two key size worth of, of bytes and then calculate the Hamming distance that, as you've seen, is based on XOR, um, you know that XOR you can imagine that the byte in A would be um, A0, uh, XOR with K0, which we don't know the, the key value. Now, that will end up XOR with B0, which is also XOR with K, K0. So at the end, the result will be the same as the Hamming distance between the, the two plain text blocks in key size. Now, the Hamming distance between plain text is lower because English doesn't use, again, randomly all the space. <laughs> yep, counting bits is useful. <laughs> um, so essentially, it elides the key when we get the key length right, because if the key length is wrong, we also have the key, key, the different key, key positions in it, and so it won't work. So we start with um, estimate, I mean, let's keep using find, repeating XOR size. with in. Let's make sure that the instructions here are the same. So it does suggest here that you could proceed with the smallest uh, key size values. I kind of don't want to write the other function uh, to uh, try all the key sizes and score them. So instead, we're gonna um, yeah, we're gonna take longer blocks so that the um, effect is um, is more more visible. So for key len from two to key len, uh, what does it say here? 40, okay, let's do 40.
let's try it out this way. First, by taking a few um, blocks. So, for example, five. Um, so, in this case, it's A would be input to kilen times, let's say, five. That might overflow. Uh, it's cheating to make it very specifically. Uh, actually, it won't overflow. Yeah, no, we're fine. Uh, ta -ta -ta. And B. Okay, again, we do the usual thing with um, I don't know, last score is a bad name, um, should be best score. Float, probably float. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, we take the Hamming distance. We set the score to float 32. And let's just stick to float 64s. Machines are powerful. Probably needless, but um, of the Hamming distance between A and B, why float? Because we need to divide by the key length. Because oops, because if we don't, longer key lengths will uh, have higher scores simply because they have they are longer and have more things to to add together, which is a good tip because it's very easy to get wrong. Um, yes, thanks, Adrian. Okay, um, and usual, if score is higher than the best score, we set Rest to this and best score to this, and at the end we return rest. This should do it, but we kind of won't know until we actually try the crypting. So let's start writing the function. At wait, this is still problem six. We need to write a read a file, so we copy paste this. This is awful, so we unpack it. Um, the file is called six, yes. And it was base 64, right? Uh, yeah. <coughs> the code from... Uh, I have to allocate the destination. Fine, I'm writing a helper. Um, How did I call the other one? Hex the code? That was stupid. Uh, 
<laughs> that way it's the same function. Std encode and why don't I have autocomplete? Now, um, mm, mm, I suspect we should even have a helper for read file. I really hate writing boilerplate. And they're only needed because they make uh, it kind of nicer to look at the um, at the tests, and they're nice because they take since they take t, they can abort automatically. Um, so they they don't need to return an error, so we don't have to check the error, which keeps it readable. Um, let's go back and kill the order. Cool, like this. So we should have text and then we run Find repeating XOR size on text. And we likely size fifteen. I don't remember if it's the correct one, so we'll keep going with this one and if if it doesn't pan out, uh, we reconsider trying the first few. Okay, so now that we know the key size, um, it's, um, yeah, you can imagine it. Uh, A, B, C, D, E. So these are five, um, 10, So these are 15, uh, let's say. Now, if our text is this, it's encrypted like this. If we put them in columns, if we split it at the key size, and then we look at each column separately, they're all encrypted with the same XOR key. So if they're all encrypted with the same XOR key, we already have a function to, to break that. So we can just use that. <coughs> yeah. So find repeating XOR key. And 
as we said. First, we figure out the key size. with what we just did. Once we have the key size, we make a column, which is a by slice of length, um, long like the length of the input divided by the key size but we wanted to round up and the trick for rounding up was um, adding key size minus one this is right yeah it's right so the division rounds down we want to round up because we want to have space in the column for uh, you can imagine that if the text ends here, some of the columns will not be the same length, which by the way is how you break poem codes, which is what a, I have a stash of poem code encrypted notes from Italian partisan that I did for my um, high school graduation and that's how I broke them. I, you can see the patterns in the length of the columns when he would put dots every time he copied. I'm, but I'm diverging. Uh, so we have a slice to keep the column and for um, an index in um, which starts at zero and for each column which there's key size columns imagine yeah 15 columns Let's call this call. All right. In each column, um, we go through the Cipher text, so uh, we fill the column, we make it into a line by taking for each position in the column, we take. we set it to in i times key size. If um, again, it might happen that we try to read something around here so if that happens the text is long enough that we can afford a zero byte in there so we just skip it so if it's we just skip it so now that we have a column filled in uh, as we said it's just find single single xor key so we need to pass the corpus to that function. And we just keep around uh, by slice of the length of the key size to hold the key.
Oh, I'm not returning the key here, am I? Uh... <sighs> Such a ugly function is becoming. What did it just... Oh, no, no, don't do that. You know what? This is one of the rare cases where I think... It makes sense to use... I kind of hate naming the returns. But this should make it cleaner. There we go. Now, uh, we don't care. K and we don't care. This should work. Um, yeah, there is no syntax um, highlighting. Uh, I'm trying it out. It is possibly one of the fake use. Um, this will definitely break a bunch of things around here. Uh, we said rest, so we need to add nothing here and nothing here. Making sure everything still works. It still works. Okay. We're being kind of inconsistent because find repeating XOR key returns the key. Well, find single XOR key returns everything, but. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, XOR is. Um, um, Exploring something twice makes it uh, go back to plain text. So here we can just call repeating XOR once we have the key. So uh, find repeating XOR key um, on text and corpus. And if this worked, we can also log the result. All right. Oh. This won't work. This will work. Was it Q, um, the one that uses the um, a Go syntax representation of the value will, will be perfect. Okay, drum rolls. Everybody followed how we're doing this? Wrong. <laughs> 
um, how we're doing this is doing it wrong. Someone said you're missing something in your index and now I'm starting to think because why is the key the same? Uh, you're definitely allowed to help. Yes. <laughs> I'm probably setting Oh, um, yes, uh, mm, starting to be tired in the coffee, uh, yeah, I'm clearly missing, so the i position in the column should be taken from in, plus call? Uh, Okay, uh, I can follow my own code. Uh, this is bad. Mm. Yeah, it's plus call. So, also this needs to be plus call. That didn't fix it, did it? But it did make the key look different, at least. Also, that's kind of not what I wanted for the... Um, hold on a sec. I should be back. Was I on mute? Like, confirm that the mute button works for when I will be saying terrible, terrible things. Okay. Hmm. Okay, I, I'm getting confused. So, this is right. Uh, so the i-th position in the column, um, which is for example, uh, here would be the, which is essentially the row, the row it needs to be filled by row times the key size, yes. Hmm, no, it's right. Hmm. Yeah, there's too many for, for loops in this function. Uh, I wrote code I'm not following. Uh, yeah, no, this is right. Plus the column position so that we take the... Um, Yeah, so I should be row instead. Row times key size plus column. Let's just call it row. Uh, 
No, uh... I suspect this is right. So probably we need to check multiple keys. Again, multiple key sizes. That's unfortunate. What happens if we very scientifically alter this number? It very scientifically doesn't work. But it did change the likely size. Uh, that's not good. Ah, sigh. <laughs> Let's make it more scientific. Yeah, that was too long. Still too long. Hmm. And it changed again. Okay, we have a problem with the key size uh, computation. We might need to try multiple of them and then score the results. Oh well, let's do that. Is the key scoring wrong? No, we're dividing it by key size, so no. Hmm. Yeah, we have a problem with key size Ooh, yes AML weems uh, I am maximizing the hemming uh, distance I should be minimizing it yes thank you <laughs> Yes, so let's go back to five here. And yes, that might just be it. Um, yes, I'm following the instructions here. And of course here it says that the um, uh, with the smallest normalized edit distance, because as we said, uh, random stuff, misaligned will have more mismatches than English text and when you get the right uh, key size you align the key so the key goes away and you're now calculating the humming distance between the plain texts. Cool, yes. Um, no idea how long I'm gonna stream. Uh, we're definitely getting to the end of set one and then I, I don't know. Uh, we might keep going. Uh, we'll figure it out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Likely size zero. Right, best score needs to start from an uh, extremely high number so that, yes. Uh, max float 64. We are minimizing, so we start high and... Oh, come on! Are there more than one bugs? Back to science! 10.
Likely size 2? That looks wrong. Uh, the Weitz by the Keylamp. Um, takes the hem in distance, the Weitz by the Keylamp, which seems right. Should it divide by Keylamp? Times ten. Feels like it should. But it's not that. No, also because normal normalization is gonna be the same. That that was just a uh, dividing by a constant factor. Hmm. Okay, uh, science solved it. <laughs> okay, th the lesson is that this is not actually that reliable and you sh should actually do what the challenge says and try the first um, a few uh, possible sizes. But yay! The key is Terminator X, bring the noise. And you get all the lyrics. These lyrics are probably copyrighted. Is this stream about to get DMCA'd? <laughs> anyway, okay, this worked. This sucks that, like, how much can we change this without destroying it? Hey, okay, we can change the bend. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of sucks that there are... <laughs> there are valid lucky numbers. But yeah. So it is... So the question, why don't you compare in to key size and in, in from key size one? I'm not sure I understand it actually, what the question is. Like why am I not adding one? Is that it? Uh, you don't add one. Uh, slices are nice like that, uh, where if you slice up to five, you get. So say that kilen is five, you you get the first five. Essentially. Um, oh, I see. Why don't I just? Um, because I get a more precise reading by adding that that in there. You're saying why I don't do this? Um, because if I use wider uh, blocks, I get a more interior, a less noisy result. In practice, it's just about that. Okay, uh, let's call it sold. <laughs> Okay. Sweet. Um, this is indeed uh, very hard to get, uh, very easy to get wrong. Um, next. Oh, yellow submarine, yes. This is where I found out that that's a perfectly 16-byte long string and also why I used it for the Harbleed test. 
Um, the basics for enco uh, encoded content in this file has been encrypted, encrypted with AS128 in ECB mode, under the key, yes. Um, case sensitive, without a quote, exactly 16 characters, I like real summary, yeah, and so do I. Haha, <laughs> and now you do too, yes. Um, Okay, we're just decrypting ECB mode. Does it does it even have ECB mode? I don't think it does. It doesn't good for it. Um Okay, the crypt ECB. Uh, let's make it um, go style and make it take a cipher dot block. <laughs> Penguins. Yeah. By the way, um, if you don't know why ECB is bad, um, this is why ECB is bad. You must have seen the penguin before. Uh, Okay, mm -hmm. the crude CB, we make could take a cipher.block, which is an interface, so we don't need to. And uh, input. Um, probably the input first. And return, like all our shitty APIs, a new byte slice. Uh, Since there's no way to, like, ECB works in blocks, there is no way to decrypt something um, that is not a multiple of the block size in length. As usual, we make our output slice and then we simply call the block interface. Which, remember, never use go uh, cipher.blocks directly because they only encrypt or decrypt the first block in the bus byte slice you pass. I wish this interface forced you to slice the byte slice to the right sizes, but it doesn't, so keep that in mind. Never, uh, if you ever see someone use directly, like I'm doing, encrypt or decrypt, they're doing it wrong. Um. Oh, we probably need a key, don't we? No, we don't. Um, the cipher.block is initialized with the key. Uh, destination is out i in i. Okay. This should be it.
Okay, so ECB again is just the mode. When you have a block cipher, you have something that can take a fixed size and decrypt or encrypt into a fixed size. So ECB is does nothing else than encrypt each block of a longer thing you have with the same key or decrypt with the same key, and that's the result. It's what we just implemented. It's really not secure, and we'll see it in the challenges pretty soon. Uh, it And yeah, it really look, just looks like this. Um, test problem seven, if we need to download the file. And the input we unbase sixty four it. We initialize the AS cipher. with the key yellow submarine and we get a cipher and an error Uh, helper removes it from the stack traces so that if it fails it will tell us that it failed at this line instead of telling us that it failed at this line which would mean pretty much nothing once we start using it almost everywhere and then we call um, the crypt ECB with N and B. Actually, why did I call that? And we print the result. This should do it. The block dot cipher um, cipher dot block interface is simply something that defines a certain an interface that has a certain block size and encrypt and decrypt functions. So and it represents a keyed um, cipher. So we get AS one twenty eight by using this sixteen bytes, uh, where sixteen is one hundred twenty eight bits. Um, it would return an error if this was um, not 16 or 32 bytes. And then we pass it to the crypt ECB, which does nothing else than go over each block and decrypt it. It worked, and it's another DMCA violation. <laughs> okay, now that we have ECB decryption, what are we supposed to do? For the last challenge in set one, So now we, okay, we detect ECB mode. 
Because while you can't necessarily decrypt something just because it's ECB, you can detect it and usually even figure out something about the pattern underneath, like the penguin. A bunch of hex encoded cipher decks. One of them has been encrypted with ECB. The others are just random. Um, we need to detect it. Are they new lines separated? Yes, they're new lines separated. Okay. Now, anyone has any ideas on how we're going to detect ECB? Well, the problem with ECB is that if you encrypt the same thing, the same block, uh, if the if two blocks are equal, their encryption will be equal because encryption is a deterministic process. So that's exactly what causes the ECB penguin to be the ECB penguin. Um, the problem is that these blocks blocks of pixels that are identical will come out as identical, which is why you see random noise in um, in the borders because there, there there's a difference maybe i don't know there's 10 white pixels and 100 black pixel cells in the same block and the next one it's 11 and 99 you wouldn't be able to those two would be completely different and random but when the color is fixed same block same result so to detect them, we do we rely on that. We split it uh, up by blocks, and we just uh, look for duplicate blocks. I'm sure there is some uh, efficient way to do it that I would know if I had studied computer science, but I did not, so whatever. Um, So I'm just going to use a map. Mm. A map from string, because by slices are, def are not um, hashable, but strings are. Uh, I guess I could convert it into a big number so that... No, that's not a good idea. Um, so we're actually making a set. We're being fancy here. I am to struct this um, zero length value. We only need to know if we already seen it. We don't need to store anything specifically. Uh, the exact same for loop that we did here. And If you pass a second OK parameter, you get to know uh, if something was already in the um, um, in, in the map. So this is how you in Go you check if something is in in the map already. Mm, well. If at any point we stumble upon something that we have already seen, we return true. Otherwise, we just flag it to remember that we've seen it. This is uh, defines the type in line instead of using a name, the type, and then instantiates it and creates it. So just sets it to an empty value. Return false. We're done. 
Let's see if it works. Um, So, we start by refiling this. Probably stringifying it too. Then we split them. Um, by new lines and for um, for each of them we had the code hexit and we run detect ECB. If we get one, uh, we return, we just print it. Um, No real way to know that we've got it right, but ciphertext number 133, we're, we're told is. So if we go look it up, we can manually verify this. Uh, or maybe we don't want to, but um, uh, if I select 32, because that would be 16, and then split the lines so that we can there we go. There it goes, repeating pattern. So this is why ECB is bad, kids. Cool. We are done with set one. Uh, I suspect I should probably push this to GitHub. <laughs> yes. <laughs> good, good point. <laughs> Registering. <laughs> It's in my uh, miscellaneous, uh, mostly harmless repository. Okay. Ooh. How long was this? How long was this? It's 4.20, it started at 2, so this was a bit more than a couple hours of work. Let's see, what, what are the challenges of set two? I want to just... Ooh, block crypto. PCS7 padding, CBC mode, ECB, CBC detection oracle, by the time ECB decryption, ECB cut and paste. Ooh, that one is fun. Um, um, uh, 
pending validation and CBC bit flipping attacks. Ooh, this get uh, get fun. But there's a bunch of people in London, isn't there? Uh, it's still nine, but we would end up probably past midnight. We should probably call it call it a day. Hmm. But if anyone has questions, now's the time. Uh, feedback, now's the time. Uh, how the hell do I enable that uptime thing and maybe even um, some saved FAQs that uh, we can use? Um, uh, Ten thirty p.m. Uh, where are you? Are you in Italy? Are you in Germany? Um, London is nine thirty, right? Anyway, Q and A. Sure, I'm gonna pull this up. Floop. Prague. Yes. Nice. And I'm just gonna switch to webcam only. Is this webcam only? Yes. Hmm. Didn't expect it to work. Cool. Um, why coding Go? Uh, I do a lot of uh, Go, so why doing this in Go was pretty straightforward. I just like uh, Go, and it would have been used, been using the only thing that comes natural now. Uh, why do I like Go? Uh, very simple language uh, gets out of uh, my way. Uh, it's um, when you're tired in the evenings, you can still um, code in Go because you don't really have to figure out all. You don't have to figure out your own code. It's very explicit, even too much, some say, because you have to copy paste a bunch of boilerplate or make little helpers. But I don't mind that, and it's always very clear what the code is doing. And, and then on top of that, excellent concurrency, um, good uh, standard library, very modern, uh, excellent crypto libraries by Adam Langley, um, compiles uh, to machine code and uh, into a um, single static binary, which is wonderful for deploying, which we will need at some point when we need to steal someone's cluster to uh, do some of the challenges. So yeah, there will be why go. Hmm. Ooh. I love the list of countries. <laughs> nice. Ooh, hi Guatemala. Um <laughs> scrolling through. There are no passwords behind me, but that's the Recur Center logo, which you should totally apply for if you want to become a better programmer. <laughs> and there are wonderful rooms with glass uh, windows, so... <laughs> um, so, people are waving hi. Uh, cool books or resources um, for getting started? Oh, with Go. Uh, uh, the Go programming language. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, the, the Go programming language, uh, super nice book, um, there it goes, yeah, uh, Alan Donovan in particular built a lot of the um, static, um, static analysis uh, tooling around Go, so yes. Um, I can see some Rastashian trolling about the fact that we need to rewrite a bunch of core crypto in assembly for it to go fast. I can see you. Um, apart from the standard library, do you often need access to other crypto libraries? I do use stuff from xcrypto all the time, which is golang.org slash x slash crypto, which is, you know, not really of official but not really clear how much supported um, there was a discussion about how 
trusted it is, but it's usually pretty good code. Um, so yeah, I use that from time to time, but the others, not really, I think. Uh, I mean, depends. If you need a very specific protocol, of course, you're gonna have to fetch, I don't know, the noise protocol implementation from somewhere. But I'll, the standard library is incredibly complete for uh, programming language. I don't think there are other programming languages where you can do almost all your crypto just with the standard library. One of the nice things of code. Okay, uh, any other questions? Any feedback? Um, Someone wants to tell me how to enable bots on chat. Uh, otherwise, we are kind of done. Um, a batch of recurse center lasts uh, three months, or you can do half a batch, which is six weeks. Uh, there are no lessons, there are no um, fixed um, schedule or, or program. You just uh, work on your own uh, projects and on becoming a better programmer. Okay, then thanks everyone for watching. And if you have any other feedback, Twitter, I guess. I'm not sure I won't be uh, reading the Twitch chat. Ah, by the way, I kind of want this to be a regular thing, so it would be on um, on all Sundays, but I'm in Orlando next Sunday, so that probably isn't happening. Uh, do let me know if you'd rather me skip the week and do set two in two weeks, or pick a day during the week um, next week to do um, set two. One or the other, for me it's pretty much the same because I am enrolled in a batch of records, so I can just do this. Okay, thank you and bye.